Next, on AM 1480 WLEA, the Newsmaker Show, here's Brian O'Neill. And we have with us, as always, a Tuesday at 8.30, a Dr. Gary Ostrower. A Dr. Ostrower, thank you for joining us. Okay. Dr. Ostrower, um, we do two press conferences a day. We do the... Uh, Governor Andrew Cuomo press conferences, which are usually at 11 a.m. Yesterday they had one at 1.30. And uh, the second press conference we do is usually uh, 5 o'clock or 5.30, depending on uh, how late they get started, uh, President Trump's press conference. Now, uh, one person that we often see at the uh, press conferences for President Trump is Dr. Anthony Fauci. The Washington Post has a article out uh, this morning about uh, Fauci socks, donuts, fan art. Uh, you can see uh, honk for Dr. Fauci bumper stickers, <laughs> prayer candles depicting St. Fauci, etc. Uh, what do you make of this, um, this uh, cult following of Dr. Fauci? A <laughs> cult following, huh? Uh, yeah, the, uh, the, the Fauci phenomenon, I guess we could call it. Uh, look, uh, Anthony Fauci is a, uh, he's a heavyweight. Uh, you know, he's serious. And I would have to think, and I'm, you know, no you know, proof of this, of course, uh, no real evidence, uh, that uh, Fauci's presence uh, at these, uh, uh, you know, meetings of the, uh, uh, of the Corona Task Force has probably t- you turned uh, one of the things that has turned Trump around. I mean, you had a president who, uh, for over two months, was minimizing this, uh, this, uh, this epidemic. Uh, he was essentially saying, uh, he did say, not essentially, I mean, he said at one point, it's no worse than the uh, seasonal flu. At another time, he compared it to a common cold. And all, uh, you know, at the same time, Fauci, who is the director of the National Institutes for Allergy and Infectious Diseases, was saying something very, very different. And Fauci has enough credibility, and he has enough, you know, kind of political weight so that the president couldn't dismiss him. You know, the president has often fired people who have disagreed with him. Uh, but he couldn't do that with Fauci. And I think that Fauci's, as he's, you know, kind of gotten into the interior of these meetings, uh, has probably had more of an impact on the U-turn that the president has taken and that the uh, federal government has taken than any other single person. Uh, I think if the Republicans want to win the election in uh, 2020, uh, they should nominate Andrew Fauci. Uh, uh, he's a, uh, uh, I mean, he's a very, very impressive, uh, a very impressive individual. Uh, well, you know, uh, I hope that uh, I hope that the president continues uh, to take him uh, to take him seriously. Uh, Fauci did say. Uh, yesterday in yesterday's press conference that we can expect uh, probably a minimum of 100,000 deaths. He was talking about 100 to 200,000 and saying under certain conditions we may have many more than that. Uh, the president in yesterday's press conference was essentially saying, uh, you know, 100,000, in other words, minimizing uh, the real damage. And he was saying, and this is kind of interesting, I think, I'm talking about Trump now, was saying that this is good news, that the, uh, you know, the, we, we may be able to hold down these numbers to 100,000. Boy, I don't know whether 100,000 is ever going to be, 100,000 deaths is going to be considered good news. But considering that the president was saying as recently as three weeks ago that, you know, we had 15 cases in the United States and we expect to have zero in 10 days, uh, to hear him now talking about 100,000 really is, I think, a significant U-turn, and the president does seem to be taking it a lot more seriously. We're no longer talking about a shutdown until uh, Easter. Now he's talking about April 30th, and I think, again, based on what Fauci is saying, is we may have to expect it to last even longer than that. Looking at the Drudge Report this morning, uh, Dr. Gary Ostrower, uh, there's a headline that sounds like a a Bob Dylan lyric from Subterranean Homesick Blues, 90 days in jail if you leave home. That's uh, what uh, the mayor, Muriel Bowser, is threatening residents of Washington, D.C., 90 days in jail and a $5,000 fine if they leave their homes is something uh, she's uh, talking about the possibility of in Washington, D.C. I want to get to the topic of... 
uh, something we talked about yesterday with uh, Dr. Ismail Mayer, the Hornell anesthesiologist, is the whole cabin fever thing. Dr. Ismail Mayer suggests, hey, you know, if you can go outside and take a walk, uh, do so if you're not sick with the COVID-19 and uh, you won't make other people sick. What do you make of um, what the news coming out of Washington, D.C., the city of Washington, D.C., for city residents? And what do you make of the whole cabin fever situation nationwide, Dr. Ostrar? I think, in a way, we have two different COVID-19 uh, epidemics here. Uh, one is urban, and the other is rural. Now, that is up to this point. That may change significantly uh, in the next two weeks or so, because we're talking about, in fact, I think that Dr. Fauci said as recently as yesterday that uh, the real uh, uh, the peak uh, may come sometime in the neighborhood of uh, uh, April 11th to April 15th or so. But the peak meaning, in other words, when perhaps we can expect more people to come down with the disease and to expire from the disease. Uh, in rural America, you know, there's not a lot. I mean, here in Allegheny County, I heard today just on the news that, you know, reported on WLEA, uh, that we have now, I think, nine confirmed cases, one death. Uh, that is, uh, you know, in a county of 47,000 people, uh, that's not a lot. Uh, can people therefore go out? Can they take walks and so forth? The answer is not only can they, but they are. Uh, is that smart? Uh, I'll leave that to some of the uh, medical experts, but certainly, uh, you know, the sense of immediate threat is just much, much less here in, well, in western New York generally. And we find that to be true often in many cases in North Dakota, South Dakota, and so forth. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, not to take this uh, uh, this pandemic seriously, I think would be uh, would be crazy. Uh, it would be a lunacy at this point. And we do know, of course, that in many of the cities, and it's not just Washington, it's New York, it's uh, Chicago, it's Detroit, it was Seattle. Uh, uh, you know, you have a number of foreign cities, the most important being Milan, where uh, it's a very, very serious thing. And I think that people must be shut in as a way of reducing the degree of, you know, what they call community spread. Uh, you know, look, we're, uh, some of this is uncharted at this point. You know, we've had pandemics in the past, and even in 1918, there were people, many, many people who were shut in. But it's interesting, in 1918, the uh, superintendent of schools in New York City opened the schools, okay, he had classes continuing to meet, because he argued, and there's some basis for this, that the students were safer in school than they were playing outside of school, so, uh, you know, I'm not an expert in this area, nor are, you know, most of us. Uh, and even some of the experts are, you know, treading new ground. So I think that, you know, we're going to have to be open to, uh, uh, you know, to reason. Uh, the other point I would make is that, you know, and one of the things that puzzles me is how different the rates of infection have been in different countries. So, for instance, in Italy, you have a very, very serious epidemic, but it's not so serious in the south of Italy. It is very, very serious in the north of Italy, especially in, uh, you know, that area of Italy that we know as Lombardy, that is to say, uh, uh, you know, the Milan area. Uh, uh, in Spain, of course, it's very, very serious. In France, it's serious, though not quite as serious as it is in Italy. And yet in Sweden, okay, another European country that has, you know, in terms of the quality of the population and so forth, a lot of similarity uh, with, those other, uh, with those other nations. Uh, in Sweden, the result of infection is very, very low. And some of that may have to do with, you know, earlier testing, which, of course, we were not doing in the United States to the extent that we were kind of minimizing the old issue uh, in, 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 in Japan. Uh, which is not very far from China. You've had relatively low rates of infection, although that seems to be changing right now. And one of the reasons, perhaps, perhaps, and I don't know this for sure, uh, that they've had low rates is because uh, in Japan they wear masks rather routinely, whereas in many other countries they do not. But I might add, by the way, low rates in Sweden, and they don't wear masks routinely there either. Talking to Dr. Gary Ostrow, the longtime history professor at Alfred University. Uh, Dr. Ostrow, our Governor Andrew Cuomo headlines from this morning from the New York Times. What Cuomo 2020, uh, what the fantasy says about the 2020 reality. From the UK Guardian, will Andrew Cuomo run for president? His brother asks on CNN. Governor Cuomo answers no. 
No. What do you make of that last uh, headline there from uh, the UK Guardian, uh, quoting the CNN uh, show from last night, uh, Prime Time with Chris Cuomo, where uh, the uh, the host's brother, Governor Andrew Cuomo, said he would not run for president. Well, he said that he would not run. That kind of thing has been said before by political candidates, and then, uh, or I should say, by political figures. Uh, and then they become candidates. In other words, they kind of change their mind. It's one thing to be, you know, I remember, I guess it was, uh, you know, Calvin Coolidge who said, uh, you know, he was president, you know, close, almost 100 years ago, 90 years ago, uh, that, you know, if nominated, he will, uh, it, it, how did he put it, uh, uh, if he, he would not run, he basically said, and if nominated, I will not serve. This is for a second term. Uh, and he meant it. Okay, on the other hand, if Andrew Cuomo is drafted by the Democratic Convention to run, I am certain, <laughs> I'm, you know, I could be wrong, right? Uh, but I'm certain that, of course, he's going to accept that. Uh, uh, right now, the candidate appears to be Joe Biden. Uh, we haven't heard very much about Biden, and I think that serves him well on one level and not well on another. Uh, he's out of the public eye for, you know, a couple of weeks now. Uh, that means uh, maybe, maybe he's not going to be taken as seriously as, uh, you know, he would like to. On the other hand, he's not under real scrutiny. He's not under the kind of scrutiny that President Trump is under, that, you know, other candidates might be under. And by the same token, he's not going to make a mistake if he's out of the public eye. He's not, you know, making any of these misstatements that he's kind of, you know, famous for. But, you know, he's 78 years old. Uh, if Mr. Biden comes down with a serious case of coronavirus, uh, who knows what's going to happen to the Democratic race? Maybe, maybe that's one of the reasons why Bernie Sanders is not dropping out of the, the Democratic race. Uh, but would Cuomo accept a draft if, let's say, the first ballot at the Democratic convention uh, does not provide a clear majority for one candidate or the other? Uh, I think that Cuomo is going to be very serious. He might become a favorite son for New Yorkers, and therefore, you know, his name is going to be there. I, I, I wouldn't take his early statements about not running very seriously. Have you caught the press, uh, the morning press briefings from the governor or the president, uh, Dr. Ostrauer? Uh, not the morning. I've, I've, I've listened to the president. I've listened to in the evening. Uh, I'm struck with the degree to which all of these other people who speak you know, who follow him, uh, you have to offer him effusive praise. I mean, I think it's almost embarrassing that the president requires them uh, to offer that kind of praise uh, or else they're just not going to show up or else he's going to criticize them. But, uh, and that says something about a president, as I think, who is in many ways very, very unsure of himself, who is very, in some ways, rather insecure. People who are secure don't need and don't require the kind of praise that our president does. By the same token, people who are secure don't criticize people who he needs for cooperation, such as the governor of Michigan uh, or the governor of the state of Washington. And, you know, he refers to the governor of Michigan as that woman from Michigan. That's insulting, and I don't think that's ultimately going to hurt him. I don't think it's going to help him politically in Michigan, and I don't think it's going to help him, uh, you know, all that much elsewhere as well. Uh, by the same token, the uh, press conferences, that we've gotten some very, very good information about things like masks, about things like sending uh, those hospital ships to different areas, you know, to New York, uh, to uh, uh, San Francisco or Los Angeles or whatever. Uh, so, um, uh, but I haven't listened to Cuomo's press conferences. So We break into regular programming from bo for both, uh, and, you know, sometimes uh, the Kilmeade fans and the Rush fans say, hey, you know, what are you doing? I want to hear my regular show. And we understand that. It's just, you know, we sort of feel like in this emergency, uh, it's it, the news takes priority over the talk. Apologies to anyone who's offended. Uh, we're talking to Dr. Gary Ostrauer. We're going to come back. And are you ready for this, Ostrauer, when we get back? I do want to. I, I would like to say something when we come back about uh, the way in which the news is being presented about this, and then I'm happy to talk about this day in history. Great. We'll be back in just a moment. Stay with us.
Hey, Greg, I'm so sorry to hear about your brother's heart attack. Thanks. He's okay now, but it really got me thinking about my family. You know, could my wife still pay our mortgage if I had a heart problem? Yeah, you should call my life insurance agent at Health IQ. They apply their exclusive healthy lifestyle savings, which can save you up to 41%. 41%? That's huge. Yep. I literally got a million dollars in coverage for just $36 a month. You should check it out at healthiq.com slash easy. Healthiq.com slash easy. Balance of nature's fruits and veggies. I have a compromised immune system, so I've been taking the three veggie and three fruit for two years, and I have not gotten sick. It's unbelievable. I feel like a normal person. I'm not tired. I don't wake up tired. And it's just amazing to me that there's such a difference. Right now, Balance of Nature is offering 35% off on any new preferred order. Go to balanceofnature.com and use discount code FRUITS. Checking in now with meteorologist Rob Carroll. And hey, Rob, how's it looking for today, tomorrow, the next day? Uh, a little bit better tomorrow and the next day, Brian, as opposed to today. A satellite photo showing quite a bit of cloudiness over the state this morning. Uh, there have been some breaks down around Binghamton and out over the Catskills, but that's generally been about it. Uh, once you get into the central part of the state, work your way westward, there is extensive cloud cover. It's all due to one upper-level low-pressure system shifting from Lake Huron out towards the Atlantic. And we've got another one out in the Atlantic, so nothing's moving very, very quickly. That leaves us at risk for clouds day. may even see a few widely scattered showers. Uh, right now, as I drill down on the uh, radar, I'm showing a little bit of precipitation uh, just out to our west. Some very, very light showers, and uh, based on their motion, uh, we may see a shower or two today. Temperatures, they're only going to make their way up to about 45 to 50. Now, for tonight, we'll see lots of clouds. Could have a couple of light showers around, especially through the evening. Lows will end up between 30 and 35. Tomorrow ends up being a partly sunny day, and highs are somewhere between 45 and 50. Clouds back tomorrow night, lows near 30. Clouds give way to occasional sunshine Thursday. It's breezy, but the good news is by Thursday, we're mild to Brian. We're up close to 50. Sunrise this morning was at 652. The sun sets tonight at 736. Back with Dr. Gary Ostrauer. Um, Dr. Ostrauer, uh, I'm sorry, you wanted to say something before we move on. Yeah, I, I, there was an interesting, you, you mentioned, uh, uh, you know, cutting into the programs by Rush Limbaugh or others. Uh, you know, Rush Limbaugh had said something about two weeks ago. He said that, you know, why are we closing the country down? Why would we close it down for, you know, something that's no worse than the common cold? And uh, they've, you know, the, 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 some of these Fox uh, broadcasters have really kind of turned around since then, just in much the same way that the president has. And there's a fellow by the name of Gabe Sherman. He is a reporter, very good reporter for Vanity Fair, who wrote an article, I can't remember whether it was yesterday or the day before yesterday, in which he speculated that the reason why some of these Fox broadcasters have so changed their tune is because Fox is fearful at this point that the degree to which they minimize this whole issue, and people have since not only gotten seriously ill, but many have died and many more will die, that it may leave Fox open, for, uh, open to lawsuits. And so, you know, the fear of... Uh, of, of, of liability uh, may have, uh, you know, explained some of this. Now, whether that's true or not, uh, I don't know. What kind of evidence, if there is any real evidence, uh, I don't know. I do know that the Murdoch family, which owns Fox, that the Murdoch family has taken the uh, COVID-19 threat a good deal more seriously than some of the broadcasters uh, that we often hear on Fox. But after that, I'm quite willing to go to uh, uh, this day in history. And there are a couple of things that happened this day in history, which I think are, from my perspective, of real interest. Uh, go ahead. Uh, you know, well, one is that, and we're going back to the year that Columbus discovered America, okay? That's 1492, a year, by the way. This is the one about Spain. About 20... I saw that one. Uh, that about 25% of all high school students do not know, do not know in what year <laughs> Columbus discovered America. But in any case, uh, in that very same year, in that very same country, from that very same country, namely Spain, uh, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella expelled in 1492 all of the Jews and all of the Muslims from Spain. Much of the southern half of Spain had been Muslim until uh, the uh, the fifteenth century, in other words, until that very very same century of the fourteen hundreds, uh, and then the uh, 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 Isabella and also 
uh, and also Ferdinand, coming from two different areas, one from Castile, the other from Aragon. Uh, if you know your geography, you have a sense as to what I'm talking about. Were able to expel the Muslims and uh, led to a. This is the same uh, you know period when there was a certain amount of resistance to the Catholic Church, and it led to a. Uh, Inquisition, uh, what we call the Spanish Inquisition. The Spanish Inquisition begins in the year 1484, and in 1492, about eight years later, uh, the decision was made to uh, expel all of the Jews and all of the Muslims. And it's one of the more disgraceful moments in Spanish history. Uh, many of the Jews were given the choice of either converting uh, to Catholicism uh, or dying. I mean, quite literally, you know, uh, uh, not much of a choice. I I suppose, you know, uh, an offer they can't refuse. So many of them did convert. Uh, they were called conversos. Some of them really did become Catholic. Others became kind of secretly, they remained secretly Jews, though becoming outwardly Catholic. Uh, and, uh, and many others simply left. Uh, uh, thousands of them, many thousands, about 60,000 of them uh, poured into Portugal, and some of them eventually, uh, in you know, succeeding years over the 16th century, uh, would make their way to to uh, the Spanish colonies uh, in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, but it was a very, very important moment, and it says something about the Spanish Inquisition. And I might also add about that Spanish Inquisition. There was a guy, and by the way, the Spanish Inquisition is not only going to target Jews and to target Muslims, but especially after 1517, when the Reformation begins, it's going to target Protestants. And there was the, le the leader of the Spanish Inquisition was a fellow by the name of Thomas Torquemada. Torquemada is one of these guys that you would not have wanted to meet in a dark alley. He was a guy who really enjoyed, and I really mean this in a literal sense, enjoyed killing people. And when he killed them, whether we're talking about Protestants, or we're talking about Jews, uh, he killed them in ways he would torture them, he would burn them at the stake, and he would kill them in some very, very imaginative ways, placing them into coffins filled with nails, uh, quite literally cutting them uh, in half, uh, inserting hot, uh, uh, hot pieces of metal into different uh, you know, areas of their body, including the, uh, uh, the, the, their mouths, but other areas as well that we won't go into right now. Uh, it was a very, very dreadful period uh, in Spanish history, and that's why I think the Spanish Inquisition has today the kind of uh, reputation uh, that it uh, well deserved. Dr. Ostrauer, uh, from my memory of it, a lot of the... Um people who were accused in the Spanish Inquisition were accused of witchcraft. Uh, are you surprised that the Salem witch trial happened uh, in America, in New England, after the uh, unpopularity of the Spanish Inquisition? I'm, I'm, I'm just assuming that the Spanish Inquisition was not popular with the people who uh, presided over the Salem witch trials uh, in, where was that, Massachusetts? It was in Massachusetts. It was in Salem, Massachusetts. It was in the year 1692. But I think we really have to remember, I mean, this is a very, very, very religious age. And not only a religious age, but an age in which the people believed that there were all kinds of evil spirits around. Uh, and the, you know, the witchcraft phenomenon becomes simply a part of that. What happened in Salem, where 20 people were executed, pales in, con in, in comparison to what was happening in respect to the whole subject of witchcraft in some of the European cities, like in Münster, Germany, where over 400 people uh, or 400 you know, alleged witches uh, were killed. And of course, in Salem, if you admitted that you were a witch, then they wouldn't execute you. But if you didn't admit it, uh, they would, you know, test you in certain ways, see whether you floated, see whether you, you know, sunk below the surface of the, uh, 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 uh of a pond. Uh, and if you didn't admit it, then you were subject to execution. And finally, finally, they stopped this when some of the, the wives, especially the wives, about 75% of the people who were executed were female, when some of the wives of the leaders of the community were accused of witchcraft. And at that 
point, the uh, powers that be finally said, hey, this thing has really gone uh, too far. But when I say evil spirits, I mean, you know, why do we cover our mouths when we yawn? And the answer is not out of common courtesy, because way back then, they believed that when you yawned, evil spirits would enter your body by uh, you know, covering your mouth, presumably you'd block that from happening. Uh, and this was true all over Europe. And it was not only true among, uh, uh, you know, the Calvinists in Massachusetts or the Catholics in Spain. It was true among the Jews who lived in these little shuttles, these little villages in Eastern Europe and so forth. I mean, this was a very, very religious age. Uh, they had not yet uh, been introduced to the wonders of modern science. You know, that comes with what we call the scientific revolution. We've been talking to uh, Dr. Gary Ostrar. We are out of time. Dr. Ostrar, as always, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me here, Brian.